welcome Marcel van Hatten. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much for the invitation. I'm so, so happy to be here in Colombia for the, well, second time, but the first time was just traveling through uh, Bogota. I, I visited the city for maybe the eight hours I had instead of staying in the airport. And uh, so this is the first time that I'm really enjoying a little bit more uh, being here. I'm actually sorry for not arriving before. My plans were to be here already on Wednesday, but exactly because we had a very busy schedule in Parliament this week, I had to postpone uh, my trip and I arrived a couple hours ago, a little bit more than that. So uh, thank you very, very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for everything that you are doing for Liberty around the world. And uh, thank you Chris Morin from Acton University, Acton Institute in the United States, who's also made that possible and uh, who is also doing so much in America. Um, I regret I was not here earlier to watch you speak and Glenn Cripe, where's Glenn? From Language of Liberty. We organized some events in Brazil some years ago when I was living in the Netherlands. We had a joint uh, endeavor. <laughs> I was living there and we were selling tickets from abroad and people showed up, more than 150 Brazilian students in our first event back in 2012, uh, uh, doing uh, an event that was totally unseen in Brazil, speaking of liberty in English. So it was very nice. And Glenn, introduced me to Jacek. So Jacek, whom left the last time or the one before the last time we met, uh, we had dumplings in Katowice in, in Poland. So it's very good, Chris, to see all of you around here and meet some friends. This is for sure already enough. Uh, for me, it has been a worth trip only for this. I hope that uh, we can make and we will much more of it in the next couple hours and days. And thank you for all the organization. Uh, let's start to talk a little bit about how to confront the Leviathan in Brazil in politics. I was try to uh, make a quick uh, overview of the Brazilian situation, of what we have there. Uh, that we call the patrimonialism and how things pretty much work there. Of course, this is an audience to which I do not have to speak that much about the evil a government can mean for a people. But anyways, it's important for us to have an overview about Brazil and then Afterwards, in the, through the end of the lecture, I want to talk a little bit more about how difficult it is in countries such as ours to get different people, new people, people that are not normally engaged in politics, how difficult it is to make these kind of people, I mean, you and me, uh, involved in politics to try to change things. And why uh, the institutions are built, especially political parties, the political system is built in such a way to make it difficult for different people to take part in politics. And maybe I'll tell you something that you never even thought really about. So, well, patrimonialism. The Brazilian political structure has historically been associated with patrimonialism, which is the lack of distinguishing characteristics between the public sphere and the private sphere. Patrimonialism is an expression of traditional politics. In political language, patrimonialism is the use of public resources for private enterprises and interests. A common and recurrent case, just to give you an example, which is certainly uh, of the uh, knowledge of everybody here, one of a common and recurrent case of patrimonialism in Brazil, Brazilian politics is nepotism. That is, the appointment of relatives to bureaucratic positions. There are numerous cases of relatives of Brazilian politicians taking bureaucratic positions based on nepotist practices. It's important to note that uh, we have a law in Brazil at the moment that 
prohibits nepotism. But what we see many times is that the politician asks another politician to have his son or daughter or relative, whatever, uh, working for him so that he is still uh, 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 still, uh, and he's not uh, acting illegally. The courts try to, you know, uh, prevent that from happening, but it still happens. The patrim patrimonialism actually tailors the, sit the state to suit private interests. The control of budgetary res resources and the ability to appoint individuals to political and bureaucratic positions enable the instrumentalization of the state apparatus for family, private, and personal interests. In Brazil, the state, besides being large and ubiquitous, has historically been a vehicle of social upward mobility for civil servants, politicians, and also for military staff. I think it's not much different in many other countries. Well, actually, I'm pretty much sure about it here in Latin America, also in other places in the world, but uh, it's especially telling here in Latin America and in Brazil as well. Individuals manage to get rich in politics and in political and bureaucratic positions, be it through high salaries, accumulation of unfair benefits, or ultimately, corruption. It's an issue that we try always to, uh, to tackle and to combat when uh, we talk about uh, how to prevent politics to become attractive for people who are not seeking to do the common good or to reduce the size of the state, rather they're seeking to engage in politics only for their own good or for their own, uh, for, for, for their own sake. This drainage of state resources for private purposes is a historically pervasive process in Brazil. In addition to being adaptable, it is resilient and made itself pre present in our present, sorry, in our history from a monarchical era to the advent of the Republic. And yet today, after roughly 35 years since the reinstatement of democracy in Brazil, which happened in the year of 1988 with our new constitution, we have a true Leviathan state in Brazil. And, and maybe it is interesting to uh, note what the Leviathan was, according to, to the Bible, if we look into the book of Job, because many People talk about Leviathan. Actually, uh, Chris and I were talking about the topic of this uh, lecture, and he suggested that the Leviathan, which was uh, also a way that uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, pictured uh, the state. But we have maybe, if, if we look into the, the book of Job, we, is Job or Job? Job, right? In English. We can, we can have a better idea of what exactly. Hobbes is meant with Leviathan and why we use this word. What, what search of monster was it, a juggernaut? So if we look at it, we can see that the monster, the, 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 the depiction sorry, of, the, of the monster was uh, in the chapter 41, 13. Who can discover the face of his garment? Who can come to him with his double bridle, bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible roundabout. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that nowhere, imagine, nowhere can come between them. That was the depiction of the juggernaut, the, the, the monster. They are joined one to another, the scales. They stick together. They that they cannot be sundered. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. The sword of him that lays at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, not the harpoon. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. So imagine the state, go back to the book of Job and see if the Leviathan is not what we see today as being the state. How difficult it is to change it. Uh, and maybe it's even more than the Leviathan because now I, live, now I am working in there and, and, and many times 
I return home after voting in parliament and I see that the state actually got stronger, if that is possible. That it got actually more resistant to change, as if it, this were possible. The Leviathan is a biblical sea serpent. And Thomas Hobbes, as I just mentioned, also made reference to the Leviathan when he talked about the state and also the state of nature. There's a sentence about actually these uh, deceptions we have in politics made by a former Brazilian member of parliament, late Roberto Campos. He's maybe the most well-known Brazilian politician who was a libertarian or liberal conservative pol politician. And he said, when I first arrived in Congress, my aim was to do good. I have now realized that the best that can be done is to prevent evil. Is a phrase that actually is, is very much uh, used in, in my own lectures because that's, that's what I feel many times. We try to do good, but in the end we know that if we can prevent evil from happening, we're doing already a lot in the context of a Leviathan state and of servants of this Levi Leviathan state who are my colleagues in parliament. So it is rather hard to fight the Brazilian Leviathan, but as a classical liberal congr congressman, I'm fully confident that this is my mission. I am of the belief that elected politicians must work to reduce the size of the state and the influence of their fellow politicians and of bureaucrats in the life of individuals to use one's own power to reduce it. Thus it is possible to fight the Leviathan from within, even though sometimes, or many times, we are a bit uh, down from the results we achieve in the end of the day. We have many benefits, for instance, that a congressman enjoys in parliament in Brazil, and I always like to talk about them when I give lectures uh, in Brazil and outside. We have state-provided apartment of housing allowance. We used to have a special federal pension. Up to 25 cabinet advisors can work for a member of parliament in Brazil, so I can hire up to 25 people, my staff. We have reimbursement of medical expenses, unlimited. And a mon monthly office allowance of up to 40,000 reais, roughly $8,000 a month. So what we do first to try to show that we can reduce the size of the state is to not use all this that is at our disposal. Actually, to use only a big fraction, a little fraction of it, only the necessary to provide a good mandate for society. So from the office allowance, for instance, I don't use more than 20% from what we have. From 25 people that would work for me, I have now seven in my office. There, I do not use, and I actually, uh, told the chamber that I will never use the medical reimbursements I am entitled to, nor me, neither my family, who is also actually entitled to as a politician. And I do not use the state-provided apartment or the housing allowance. So I think it's very important for us when we are talking about how to change the uh, state administration to start giving our own example and uh, renouncing to privileges that we could uh, actually be enjoying. But with the benefits enjoyed by public servants sometimes are even bigger than these ones that I just told you. There's job security in Brazil. A public servant cannot be fired for budgetary reasons. There's no talk about that. If there's no budget, you know, go find a way to, to pay them uh, with more taxes or in that in uh, the country, but there's no way you can fire someone for budgetary purposes. There's no serious assessment of performance of public servants and perks that increase the actual salary and thereby violate the paycheck limit defined by the federal constitution we see all the time. There are full pensions for a large number of well-lobbied lobbied public servants categories as well. They don't, don't contribute during their uh, working period of, you know, when they are working uh, enough for the uh, pensions that they receive later. There are also too many state-owned companies in Brazil. 
there's too, too much state intervention in the economy, and the state enacts sector and theme-oriented policies that benefit some sectors of the economy at the expense of others. I'm sure you never heard about that, right? So we have a disproportionately large pool of public servants, which enables the proliferation of interest groups like linked to the unions, associations, and also to the state itself, all of which defend their own acquired privileges. Institutions were made to serve clear purposes, but at some point in their trajectory, they end up primarily serving only themselves. This is how we try to fight these privileges. Congressmen from my party, the Novo Party, we deliberately refused to make use of these benefits and privileges enacted by the Brazilian law. We also consistently vote in favor of privatization of state-owned companies and of the enactment of a more rational and business-friendly pension legislation in Brazil. That's actually what we, what we did in the first year of our mandate. By the way, a minor correction, the elections in Brazil were in 2018, so my first year of mandate was 2019. I'm now through the third year, and next year is election year in Brazil. Our terms, mandates are four years. There's no intellectually solid majority, however, in Brazil at this moment to combat Leviathan from within in the Brazilian structure. We have to try to convince our colleagues many times through um, means of you know, public support, pressure, and so on. By the way, uh, we try to do it every day in Parliament, also through negotiations. It's not always easy because we have to stick to our principles, but still, sometimes we can get some of our uh, proposals uh, through. Congressmen, unfortunately, allow their legislative act activity to be oriented by the perceived need to extract resources from the state and have it parasited by their own, often incompetent political appointees and corporations that are either state-owned or dependent on the state to thrive and or to survive often have a strong lobby aimed at preserving this dysfunctional system. There's a somehow entropic trend, therefore, for the Leviathan to protect itself. Brazil is one of the countries with the largest wage bills relative to total central government expenditure. Classical liberal think tank Instituto Millennium is a, a Brazilian think tank, has pointed out that only in 2019 the amount spent with civil servants was in the ballpark of about 930 billion reais, about 200 billion dollars, which means that roughly 13.7% of Brazil's GDP was destined to cover government staff and personal costs. Vis-a-vis 6% destined to education, 3.9% to health expenditures. So I will repeat these numbers. 13.7% of Brazil's GDP was destined to pay to cover government staff and personal costs. 6% to education, 3.9% to health expenditures. As a result, Brazil ranks seventh in the 63 members list of countries that spend the most with their respective civil services. It is worth noting that within the subgroup of emerging countries, developing countries, Brazil's G GDP percentage destined to government staff and personal costs is roughly twice the percentage destined, for instance, here, by Colombia to the same item. In Colombia, is about 6.4%, also according to Instituto Millennium. In its three decades of Brazil's civil service, the Institute for Applied Economic Research has concluded that in 2006, the cost of Brazil's civil service was around 472 billion reais, about 80 billion dollars, and in 2017, it reached 751, therefore increasing 59% over the course of 11 years, just over this last 11 years. In order to change this reality, we need a rigorous and fair administrative reform, which is soon to be enacted by the National Congress in Brazil. In addition to that, Brazil faces a major problem posed by pay paycheck trinkets and perks that managed to dodge the 39,200 reais public service pay limit. There's a pay limit. Nobody should be able to get more than a member of the Supreme Court. However, there is a lot of uh, different ways that the public servant can get more than that 
housing allowances and other kind of uh, perks that they have. By late 2019, for instance, the newspaper we started in Sao Paulo shown that the meal allowance paid to judges in 24 out of the 27 Brazilian states was superior to the national minimum wage, only the meals that were paid to them. Finally, I would like to remember an outwardly bizarre proposal to double the constitutional pay limit recently submitted to the National Congress in Brazil. I've dubbed it the duplex pay limit, as it has outrageously allowed retired, allowed retired civil servants and military personnel to accumulate their respective pensions with the salaries corresponding to their current office, thereby surpassing with the legal technicality the constitutionally established limit of 39,200 reais. In order to eradicate this legal and administrative excrescence, I've presented a draft legislative decree at the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies, laying down rules and procedures to ban this practice. However, so far, uh, I am not successful in that effort, but we keep on combating. According to the Special Secretariat for the Statization, Disinvestment and Markets of the Brazilian Ministry of Economy, that, that's, that's a good one. The federal government participates in over 600 businesses when it is taken into account all of its shares in state-owned and mixed capital companies. The federal government holds direct control of 46 companies in Brazil and 152 subsidiaries. In addition to these more than 600 business and direct control of 46 companies and 152 subsidiaries, there are 218 colligated enterprises, those in which the companies are subsidiaries whose controls are directly held by the federal government exert significant influence, and 208 enterprises with simple participation, those in which the companies are subsidiaries whose controls are directly held by the federal government exert unleveraged influence. A textbook case of Brazilian bizarre state interventionism is the company EPL, Planning and Logistics Company, which was created in the year 2012 in order to obtain the financing and implement the construction of the high-speed train that was supposed to connect the cities of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. 2012, remember, two years before the World Cup. The train was never built, and the project was mothballed in 2015. But, believe it or not, the EPL still exists, and as of March this year, it has a staff of 82 employees. <laughs> the directors make 30, 40,000 reais a month worth of salaries. We have even a uh, condom factory in the state of Acre, who has also the, which has also the participation of the Brazilian company, a Brazilian government. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, in the business. So this is this is only an overview of Brazil. I could be talking forever of uh, very of different cases and what we see regarding the big Leviathan we have there. But it's important also. And then another phrase that Roberto Campos has was very good is, whatever good that may be done by the state, it is limited. The evil it can enact, on the other hand, is infinite. What a state can give us is always less than what it can take from us. And another phrase that's actually mostly a sad, it's, it's a very sad phrase of his, Brazil unfortunately never misses the opportunity to miss opportunities. Well, anyways. We're trying to prove him wrong. We're trying in Brazil to make the difference, to have more libertarians in politics, more political conservatives, political liberals in politics, trying to reduce the size of government and the power of government. However, it is very difficult in Brazil to have political participation of libertarians. First of all, because the political system in Brazil is a true cartel. And it, that is what I want to talk a little bit more about in the end of my uh, presentation. I don't know how many more minutes I have, but... We have 15 minutes, and okay. but we can take the uh, audience questions if you want. Okay, so we have a, a political system, a party system that is a true cartel. In Brazil, as in it, it is in Colombia, the political parties must be national to start with. So we cannot start 
a known political party in our municipality or in our region or state. The party must be national in order to be officially authorized to have candidates in the elections. But that's not only it, because if you just started a party and say, okay, my party is national, that would be okay. Even though we are a federation, that means it's actually a contradiction. If you're a federation, you believe in subsidiarity principles, so actually parties should also start little, small, and then grow, and then maybe become regional or state-wise, uh, uh, but that's not the case. Or maybe join other parties in a federation, as we see, but that's not the case. So you have to be national, and that happened for the first time in Brazil in the 40s, when Getúlio Vargas, he was a dictator in Brazil, but he was just being, you know, in the end of his dictatorship, uh, he was not able to continue because of political pressure, because of social pressure, and he decided to step down, but before he stepped down, he decided to, to, to start two parties of his own, declared, he, he introduced a bill saying that parties should be national, and from the three parties, he controlled two, what made him also be able to return as a democratically elected president in Brazil in 1950, five years after he stepped down as, or stepped out as a dictator of Brazil. And this characteristic is still maintained in Brazil. All parties should be national, but it's worse than that. If you want to start a political party of your own, you need to have at least 1% of the population supporting your party, or at least supporting it to become a party. Not the population, the electorate. And 1% is roughly 500,000 people. So you have to find 500,000 people willing to sign a paper saying, I support Marcel starting his party. But it's more than that. You need to have 0.1% of the signatures of the electorate of at least nine states. It's worth, worse than that. Now you have to do it in two years. If you don't get it in two years, you have to start it all over again. Even President Bolsonaro started recently to start his own party, uh, tried, sorry, to start his own party, and he wasn't able to. So one thing that I advocate a lot in Brazil is that we give more freedom to people to participate in politics via the, uh, uh, through the, 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 the existence of local parties. This week, less, it was actually yesterday, I, I, I could, we have all the, you know, the, 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 the legislative process is, is quite slow, but I could put, I could revoke in our constitution the national characteristics of parties in the bill that was proposed for the political reform. And to the last minute it was there, but in the end, yesterday more than 400 Members of parliament said no, only 28 voted with me to try to revoke that uh, obligation. If we look to Latin America, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Paraguay, Dominican Republic, Republic and Uruguay, all these countries, they don't allow also political parties to be regional. Whereas if we look into Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, they are the few exceptions in our continent. As we look into Europe though, we see that it's very easy to start your own party and in no, no country it is necessary to be national. In Belgium, for instance, you don't need any signature, neither in, in showing support, neither in Germany or in Spain. In Italy, it varies according to the district. In the Netherlands, you don't need it. In Austria, you don't need it. In Portugal, you need only 5,000 people signing the creation of a party with 18 years or, or more. In Sweden, 1,500 people signing, and you can start your own party. In the United Kingdom, none. So I think this is an important thing for us to bear in mind uh, to, through the end of, our lecture, um, of my presentation, short presentation. I would like to discuss it a little bit with you. Because institutions matter and matter a lot and they are built in our countries according to the will of the Leviathan, according to what the political system wants. 
When I tried in Parliament this week to say that it was important to have this freedom, the common answer was, you're crazy. More parties. We have already too many parties in Brazil. And this is true. We have about 25 parties in Parliament today in Brazil. But that is, it is there. We should have like a way, like in Germany, if a party doesn't have 5% of the votes nationally, it doesn't have a seat. But of course, all these parties, what, what they really want, the parties that are already authorized to function, what they really want is the public money. Only for the next elections, there is a bill that we are fighting against, of course, that uh, is going to give about six billion reais, about one billion dollars to political parties for political campaigns in 2022. We don't use it. I never have, and our party doesn't use public money for a uh, political campaign. But only in the last election was about two billion reais, roughly 450 million dollars spent in political campaigns of taxpayers' money that could go for health, education, or even better stay in the taxpayers' uh, pockets that were diverted to political campaigns. And all these parties, of course, they are in a cartel and they don't want competition. They don't want new parties coming. And I try to uh, convince them of, you know, uh, these parties, these local parties, we can put in the law, they will not have access to public funds. They will not have access to the Chamber of Deputies unless they have a percentage in national uh, elections vote. But in the end, what I perceive is that this political structure is good for those who are there because in the local level, they also have the local elites who sell positions for people if they want to run. If you want to run in my party, you have to pay so much, and I give you the, the uh, and I give you the opportunity to to run. So this is a very important thing in our countries that we have to change in Latin America, give more political freedom to people because many people don't want to involve in politics because if they look at the political uh, at the party system, and I was already uh, I was in the past affiliated to a party that was not Novo Party because it didn't exist. It's a new party. When I had to choose from the parties exist and want one to become a member, I must tell you that I was feeling that I was putting a stain on my biography or something. Because people look at you and confound you with people who are in the uh, national level in the parties, who are normally people that are corrupt or, you know, in trouble with, uh, with uh, all of the other issues that I already pointed before. So I think this is something that we have to change in our countries, but still it is worth to work within, because within the state, if we don't have people like us there, the situation will only get worse. As I was telling my friend from the Netherlands, I lived there for some time, and um, I enjoyed the freedoms I saw there, at least in comparison to what we have in Brazil, maybe you will have other ideas about it, but uh, and I had the opportunity and I could make the option to live there. Actually, I was at Phoenix, Arizona at, at, at Planned Tribe's place when all this political turmoil in Brazil in 2013 started and I decided to go back to Brazil in 2014. And to, to close in a very positive note, I, would, I decided to go back to Brazil, take part in politics, actually return to politics because I had been a city councilor some years before I returned, I tried to become a state representative twice, and I did not, uh, and I, I did not succeed. When I tried for the third time, again, with not many resources, only with friends and people who truly believed the ideas that I was putting forward, uh, I decided to stay in Brazil to make the difference there because I didn't want to live in another country. I want always to live in another Brazil. So this is what I'm doing there, and this is what I'm trying to bring to you here also as a sort of an example of engagement, very necessary in the politics of each of your countries. Thank you very much. And sorry for not having a PowerPoint, but as, uh, as Chris would agree, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, right? <laughs> We have time for only a couple of questions. Uh